We are working our way verse by verse through the book of Ephesians, as I'm sure you know good and well. And this will be our last sermon on Ephesians chapter 3. So turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3. And we want to look today at verses 14 through 21. And let us stand as we read God's holy and inspired word together. Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. And may we be reminded, Covenant, that when the Bible speaks, God himself speaks. So may we approach the reading of his word with reverence and awe. Paul says in verse 14, For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That was a little weak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Father, we know the sheer power of your preached word. Use it to convict us. Use it to comfort us. Use it to change us in Christ. This we pray in his name and by your spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I'm sure you've already noticed that today's passage is a prayer from the Apostle Paul, isn't it? It's a prayer from the Apostle Paul at the church for the church at Ephesus. And I was thinking this past week, when and how and where did you first learn to pray? For most of us, we learn to pray by listening to others pray, don't we? Children often learn to pray by listening to their parents pray. New Christians learn to pray by listening to older, mature Christians. Young Christians learn to pray by listening to older Christians. Congregations often learn to pray by listening to their ministers pray, and so on and so forth. The point is that really most of us learn to pray by listening to other people pray. But have you ever learned to pray by listening to the prayer of a prisoner? Or an inmate? Have you ever learned to pray by listening to the prayer of a prisoner or an inmate? Well, in today's passage, we get to learn how to pray by listening to the prayer of a prisoner, the Apostle Paul. I've entitled this message, Praying a Prisoner's Prayer, because remember that Paul is in jail back in Rome as he writes this very letter, and indeed, this very prayer. And remember that Paul prays four prison prayers while he's imprisoned back in Rome. One prison prayer is in Colossians chapter 1, where he prays for the church at Colossia. A second prison prayer is in Philippians chapter 1, where he prays for the church at Philippi. A third prison prayer is in Ephesians chapter 1, which we examined a few weeks ago. And then there's this fourth prison prayer that Paul prays right here today in Ephesians chapter 3. And I think by examining this prisoner's prayer, we can learn some things about how to pray in our own life. Uh, there's probably many prisoners whom you wouldn't want to model your prayer life after, but Paul uh, is surely an exception to the rule. If you look at your sermon outline, I've tried to break this prayer down for you into three parts. The three P's, if you will. The posture of the prayer, the petitions of the prayer, and then the praise 
of the prayer. So the posture, the petitions, and the praise. Let's look at these three things together. If you look at verses 14 through 15, I call these verses the posture of the prayer. And I'll tell you why I say that in just a moment. But first, I want you to examine the phrase there in verse 14, for this reason. Paul says in, in verse 14, for this reason. Why does the good apostle say, for this reason? Well, look back at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1. Look at earlier in the chapter at verse 1. Paul uses this identical phrase, for this reason. Remember, back in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, Paul was just about to pray for the Ephesians. He was just about to pour out his heart and his soul in prayer, but then he gets distracted, right? And for the next 13 verses, he changes topics and he digresses to this mystery of the gospel that's now been revealed. And he doesn't resume the prayer that he started back in verse 1 until now in verse 14, which, as you'll see, starts with the identical phrase, for this reason. So he's now back to where he originally started. Now, I've called verses 14 through 15 the posture because if you think about it, Paul discusses the posture that he's going to assume as he prays for the Ephesians. And what posture does Paul take there in verse 14? Look back at the text. Clearly, Paul says, For this reason I bow my knees before the, the, before the Father. So apparently, Paul is, is on his knees as he prays. That's his, his posture. And I was thinking this this past week. There's a lot of different postures for scripture, all uh, for, for prayer, all throughout the Bible, isn't there? Let me just give you some examples of, of various postures uh, for prayer in scripture. I'm going to rattle these off. You can write them down or just listen. Uh, for example, there's the posture of lying prostrate on the ground, which is to lay on your belly, on your stomach, with your face on the ground and your arms spread out. Uh, Genesis 17:3, when God gave the sign of circumcision to Abraham, it says that Abraham fell on his face. And he prayed to God. Matthew 26, 39. It says, and going a little further, Jesus fell on his face and he prayed. He said, my father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. Uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, used to say, I do my best praying when I'm on my face. That's one posture. Another example is the posture of standing upright. When you pray, standing upright. Uh, 1 Kings 8.22, which Michael uh, just read for us at the, the dedication of the temple. It says that Solomon stood up before the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. Back in Genesis 18, verse 22, as Abraham intercedes for Sodom and Gomorrah, it says that Abraham was standing before the Lord as he prayed. So you've got lying prostrate, standing upright. And then another example of, of a posture is sitting down while praying. Just good old-fashioned sitting down. Uh, 1 Chronicles 17, 16 says that David went in and he just sat before the Lord and he prayed. He said, Who am I, O Lord? And what's my house that you brought me this far? Another example is the, is the posture of lifting your hands when you pray. Hand lifting. Uh, Paul tells Timothy over in 1 Timothy 2.8, he says, Timothy, I desire that in every place the men should pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or quarreling. Another example is the posture of turning one's face or one's eyes up to heaven during prayer. You see this in John chapter 11, 41. When Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead, it says that Jesus lifted up his eyes to heaven. And he said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. There's my personal favorite of putting your head between your knees when you pray. Maybe we'll have the elders demonstrate that at the end of the service. Uh, 1 Kings 18.42 says that uh, when Elijah went up to Mount Carmel, he bowed down and he put his face between his knees as he prayed. And of course, there's the posture of bowing or, or kneeling on, on your knees. Ezra 9 says that Ezra fell on his knees and he lifted up his hands to the Lord. Daniel 6, verse 10, after Daniel heard Darius' edict, it says he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day. Acts 20, verse 36 says that when Paul met with the elders from Ephesus, that's the elders from the letter that we're reading from, it says that he knelt down with the elders and he prayed for them before he went off to Miletus. 
You hear this, for example, in Psalm 95, one of the great calls to worship. It says, Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. So there's lots of different postures all throughout Scripture for prayer. Now, the question you're probably asking is, uh, is there a prescribed posture for prayer? In other words, does the Bible require us to have or to take a certain posture when we pray? I don't think that He does. I don't think the Lord requires or, or forces us to do any of these certain postures. But that doesn't mean that posture isn't important when we pray. Let me just ask you, what does our posture uh, signify or symbolize? To me, it symbolizes humility. To me, it symbolizes reverence or holy fear or, or submission. A posture in prayer symbolizes that you're in the presence of someone utterly important and who far outranks you. Posture symbolizes that you're not God, you're not the creator of this universe, and that you got to submit yourself to Him, not the other way around. I, you know, I also think that posture helps protect us from uh, lazy, sloppy, distracted prayers. If we try to pray to the Lord while we're watching The Price is Right, or The Wheel of Fortune, or while we're chasing our kids around the house, or while we're eating some Bojangles, we're probably going to be distracted and we'll probably produce lazy, sloppy, uh, half-hearted prayers. I mean, we all recognize to some degree that posture matters. That's why we at Covenant bow our heads and close our eyes uh, as we pray. I also think that posture can help us uh, from praying cold, dead, lifeless prayers. Sometimes we all do this. Sometimes we just go through the motions and our prayers are dead and cold and, and rote. Oftentimes I feel that when I, when I get on my knees to pray that my prayers are a lot richer, a lot warmer and full of life. John Bunyan, not Paul, but John Bunyan once said, he said, In prayer, it's better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. And I think he's saying that we should put our hearts into our prayers. And I think our posture can help us in that regard. And I would, encur I would encourage you uh, to try these postures uh, this week as you pray. Maybe for you, you need to get on your face and pray. Maybe that's helpful for you. Maybe for you, you need to lift up your hands when you pray. Just don't do that when you're driving. Maybe for you, you need to stand up to pray. It helps you from being distracted. Maybe for you, like Paul here in verse 14, you need to just get on your knees and pray. Uh, the point is that posture is important, although I don't think there's a certain posture we have to assume. Uh, find a posture that works for you, and don't be afraid to try a new posture in your prayer life. You might find that you pray better in one of these other postures. Now, notice who Paul directs his prayer toward there in verse 14. Who does he pray to in verse 14? Well, he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. Uh, praying to the Father is how Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. When we say, our Father who art in heaven. And I think it's a good idea when you pray to direct your prayers to the Father in Christ's name and by the power of the Holy Spirit. You should be Trinitarian when you pray. And if you look at this passage, you see every member of the Trinity is referenced uh, in verses 14 through 21. And then notice what Paul says of the Father in verse 15. He says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. What's that mean? Who's this heavenly family and who is this earthly family? Well, this is probably a reference to all redeemed or converted Christians, whether they be in heaven or whether they be on earth. This is the totality of all the redeemed, the dead in Christ who are currently in heaven, as well as those who are alive in Christ on earth. We're all a part of this family of God. Let me give you Tabor's paraphrase of verses 14 through 15 before moving on. Paul is saying, I'm going to get on my knees. I'm going to bow down in utter humility and reverence before Almighty God. I'm going to pray for you, Ephesians. I'm going to pray to the Father just as the Lord Jesus Himself taught us to pray. Indeed, this is the very Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. I'm going to pray and pour out my heart 
for you. That's the posture that the Apostle Paul assumes. Next, if you look at verses 16 through 19 in your text, I call these verses the petitions. In those uh, three verses, Paul offers a series of supplications or requests or petitions to God on behalf of the Ephesians. And can you just imagine how this prayer went? Here's the Apostle Paul on his knees praying to the Father, and now he's going to offer up some petitions. He's going to tell God what he needs on behalf of the Ephesians. That's what petitionary prayer is, by the way. Petitionary prayer is telling God what you need. It's telling Him what your heart desires. It's bringing your requests to Him, asking Him to answer in faith. And what we see here are several petitions in these verses. Now, if you haven't noticed, if you haven't already noticed, verses 16 through 19 are incredibly dense. And when I was preparing for this sermon, I almost didn't know what to do with all these clauses and all these phrases and all these words. But in an effort to help you track Paul's thoughts, I've tried to break down verses 16 through 19 into five petitions. And we will strategically call these petition number one, two, three, four, and five. So let's just walk through these five petitions that Paul offers and see what they mean for your life. Petition number one, Paul prays that believers will be strengthened by the Holy Spirit's power. That's verse 16. He says, I pray according to the riches of his glory. Think about that. According to the riches of God's glory that he may grant you. Here's the first petition. He may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Your inner being is your inner man, your inner person. So, so power is what Paul prays for on behalf of the Ephesians. He says, I want you to be strengthened with power by the Holy Spirit. One pastor says, if I put a million dollars in your bank account, you are a guaranteed millionaire. But if you don't know how to write a check, you cannot enjoy your million dollars. Many Christians are like that when it comes to prayer. We don't draw into our spiritual reservoir and ask God for what we need in prayer by the Holy Spirit's power and strength. In other words, we don't always tap into the spiritual resources that are available to us from God. Uh, by nature, we tend to think that we can run our lives on our own strength and by our own power. I mean, we live in a self-help culture, do we not? You can Google anything on YouTube or Google and look up how to do something by yourself. We've got self-help books, self-help blogs, self-help seminars, self-help conferences, all of which are meant to show you that you've got the power and the strength in yourself to help yourself. But the truth is that you actually don't have this power or this strength in yourself to make it through this life. No one is that tough. That's Christianity 101. You have to have the Holy Spirit's power and strength for all that you do in life. You've got to have the Holy Spirit's power and strength if you're suffering. You've got to have the Holy Spirit's power and strength if you're trying to overcome temptation from sin in your life. You've got to have the Holy Spirit's power and strength if you want to do your job proficiently at work. You've got to have the Holy Spirit's power and strength if you're going to share the gospel with others. Otherwise, you'll just chicken out. And I would challenge you to use Paul's first petition here in your life. Ask the Holy Spirit that he would grant you this strength and this power in all that you do. That's the first petition. Petition number two, Paul prays that believers, that's you and I, that we may be indwelt with Christ. He says in verse 17, Paul asks that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, look, why, why would Paul ask for Christ to indwell someone who is already a believing Christian? We know that believers already have Christ indwelling them in their heart. So why is, is Paul praying for what a believer already has? Well, in this context, the word dwell there in verse 17 means to live in. It means to settle down in. It means to make a permanent residence in. Or it means to be comfortable in. 
And this is what Paul is saying there in verse 17. He prays, I want, he says, I want Christ to dwell or reside in your hearts comfortably. Uh, D.A. Carson, perhaps one of the greatest New Testament scholars in the world, he says of this dwelling. He says, when Christ, by His Spirit, takes up residence within us, that is, when we first become Christians, He finds the moral equivalent of trash, ugly wallpaper, and a leaking roof. He's not comfortable there in our hearts. He then sets about turning this residence, our hearts, into a place that's appropriate for Him. A place for which He's comfortable so that He can dwell there. It takes Him a great deal of time for Him to change us and to transform us and to remodel our hearts into a house that reflects His own character. John MacArthur follows up on this. He says, Christ indwells us when we're first saved, when we first become Christians. But it's only when He's cleaned every room, every closet, and every corner of sin in our hearts that He can settle down there and be at home. He cannot live in our hearts in comfort until He's cleansed us of sin and filled us with His will. He cannot fully be at home in our hearts until He's allowed to dwell there and to exercise His Lordship over every aspect of our lives. I think that's what Paul has in mind when he asks that Christ would dwell in our hearts by faith. And you can pray this for your own life. You can pray this in your own circumstances. You can pray that Christ will rule and dwell in your heart and that He'll be comfortable there. Uh, you can pray that Christ will continually be, continually be remodeling your heart, cleaning out the sin uh, and the garbage in your life. You should pray that, uh, that Christ will dwell in your heart and that you'll be able to reflect Him in all that you do. Maybe you're a Christian here today. Maybe you know Christ, and you know that Christ already dwells in your heart, but you've got some garbage and some sin in your life that needs dealing with. And if that's so, you should ask the Lord Jesus Christ to clean it up. Confess it to Him. Ask Him to clean it up. Ask Him to remodel you so that He can dwell comfortably in your life and in your, your heart. Maybe you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And you want this indwelling of Christ that Paul is talking about. Well, you can have it if you, if you trust in the Lord right now. If you turn from your sin and look to, to Christ for your salvation. He'll come in your life. He'll transform you. He'll remodel you. And He'll make you into His image. That's the second petition. Look at petition number three. Uh, Paul prays that believers will be rooted and grounded in love. Let's talk about those two terms there from, from verse 17. Rooted and grounded in love. This is really interesting. The word rooted there in verse 17 is a botanical or a gardening word. It refers to how a tree has deep roots in the ground which can withstand strong uh, turbulent winds. And that's how it is in the Christian life. You've got to be rooted to withstand trials and tribulations and difficulties. If you're not rooted as a Christian, you will be uprooted when difficult times and circumstances come. Uh, the word grounded there in verse 17 is, a, is an engineering term. The word grounded refers to how a building needs to have a good, deep foundation. Uh, builders have a saying, if you don't go deep, you can't go high. And so it is in the Christian life. Without a deep foundation as a Christian, by reading Scripture regularly, by praying regularly, by coming to church regularly, you just won't grow. Paul is saying there in verse 17 that Christians have to be rooted in the rich soil of God's love and we have to have a firm, stable foundation. That's the third petition. Look at the fourth petition. We're breaking into verse 18 and 19. The fourth petition, Paul prays that believers will comprehend the fullest dimension of God's love. We've got to just reread verses 18 and 19. Look back at the text. Paul prays in verse 18. Make sure your Bible's open so we can read God's Word. He says, I pray that you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. Listen to this language. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And I want you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Now these words, breadth and length and height and depth, are words of density or dimension or measurement. 
in Bible times, and even today, you take something's measurements by inquiring into its breadth and its length and its height and its depth. If you buy a new piece of furniture, you've got to have the measurements to make sure it fits in your home before you bring the piece of furniture in. And what Paul is saying here, he's saying, I want you to grasp. I want you to understand. I want you to know the dimensions of God's love for us. I want you to know the breadth and the length and the height and the depth. I want you to measure this out. But to me, this raises a question. How is that even possible? How can you and I possibly measure the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of God's love? When I think of the breadth of God's love, I think of how God's loving arms reach all around the world to all types of people. When I think of the length of God's love, I think about how long He's loved His elect. That's from before the foundation of the world. Uh, when I think of the height of God's love, I think of how we are lifted to the very throne room of God in heaven. And remember, Ephesians 1.20 says that if you're a Christian, if you know Christ, you are actually seated on high in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. When I think of the depths of God's love, I think of how Christ humbled himself to die on the cross for our sins. He left his place on high, Philippians 2 says, and he died on the cross. James Montgomery Boyce, perhaps one of the great Presbyterian ministers of the 20th century. He tells the story of a prisoner skeleton found in a dungeon by Napoleon after the Spanish Inquisition. Uh, this prisoner was chained up by his ankle bone. And on the wall of this dungeon, right before he died, he scratched a cross with four words around each point of the cross. At the top of the cross was the word height, at the bottom of the cross was the word depth. On one side of the cross was the word length. And on the other side of the cross was the word breadth. That's the breadth and the height and the depth and the length of God's love for us. God shows His love for us in all that He does. But we see it especially on the cross, don't we? When the Lord Jesus died for His elect. Romans 5, 8 says, God shows His love for us that while we were still sinners... Christ died. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. 1 John 4.10, And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us and He sent His Son. And then Paul makes this very interesting comment there in verse 19, that we are to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? How is that even possible? How does that make sense? How can you know something that surpasses knowledge? Well, I think that phrase, surpasses knowledge, there in verse 19, means that you can't fully or completely or totally know God's love. It's too vast. It's too lofty. It's incomprehensible. You can't know it exhaustively. Uh, we're just finite, limited creatures. We can know it, but we can't know it in its, in its totality. Now that's the fourth petition. And then there's petition number five. Paul prays that believers will be filled with God. Verse 19. Paul prays. It's so interesting what he says in verse 19. He says, I want you to be filled with all the fullness of God. What does that mean? How can you be filled with the fullness of God? Well, the word fullness speaks of completeness or maturity. It means that you're growing in your faith. It means that you're maturing as a Christian. Husbands and fathers, pray that your wife and your children will be filled with the fullness of God. Wives and mothers, pray that your, your children, your household will be filled with the fullness of God. We should all pray this in our lives. Others should look at our lives and say, yeah, that Tony Langley, that Aaron Counts, uh, that Ashley Ferris, that Diane Butler, they are filled with the fullness of God. Isn't that what you want in your life? We've seen all these petitions, these five petitions. But let me just add a brief comment about a petitionary prayer in your own life. I think when we often, oftentimes when we petition God, we don't really expect Him to answer. 
We don't really expect him to answer. The story is told of a time when a great Scottish pastor prayed for rain during a heavy drought. As the pastor went to church that day, his daughter says, here's the umbrella, Papa. The pastor responded to his daughter and he kind of mocked and he said, what do we need that for? And his daughter replied, well, you prayed for rain this morning. Don't you expect God to send it? And I think a lot of us are like that Scottish pastor. We throw up prayers, but we don't expect God to answer our petitions. But the very tone of Paul's uh, 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 prayer here is that we can expect great things from God. So we've seen the posture. Paul falls on his knees. We've seen these five incredibly dense petitions that I would ask you to go and look at further later at home. And then now lastly, I want to look at the praise. Verses 20 through 21. And these last two verses, Paul simply exalts and extols and adores and really praises the Lord. Uh, Paul's as good a Calvinist as any because he recognizes that all things are for God's glory and God's praise. Look at verse 20. These may be some of the most powerful words in Scripture. Paul says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. I don't know what to say about verse 20 other than to say that it sure sounds like our God can do a lot more than we ask or think. He can do a lot more than we think He can do. you got to allow that truth to motivate your prayer life. That God can do far more abundantly than our little brains think He can do. I'd like to just close by allowing verse 21 uh, to be our closing prayer. So let's pray as we as we uh, close with verse 21. Paul says in verse 21, To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. These things we pray in Christ's name and by the Holy Spirit's power. Amen, amen. and amen.